welcome to the Julia A. Purnell Museum here in Snow Hill, Maryland. I'm Dr. Cindy Bird. I'm the curator and executive director here at the museum. Your videographer today is Lana Sadek Beva, and we thank her for doing this job. Uh, we wanted to present this video in partnership with the Worcester County Library here in Snow Hill. Um, we have had some challenges like most museums do with COVID, so we decided to try to present a video to tease you a little bit, but also to give you an idea of what we have to offer at the museum for those who aren't able to come right now. So this is our first time doing this, and we're going to just show you around. Um, if we're a little uh, casual about this, that's okay. We just want to uh, show you what the museum has to offer. I have my little cheat sheet of ideas of what I want to make sure to show you, but I'm not going to show you everything because I want to give you a reason to come back once things open up a little bit more and you're able to um, come out and about and see the museum in its entirety. So we're obviously named for Julia A. Purnell. She lived here in Snow Hill for 100 years. She was born in 1843. She passed away in 1943. But the museum was actually founded by her son, William Purnell. He loved his mother and he was very proud of her work. She was a needle artist all of her life and she made thousands of pieces uh, during her life. She became very famous for works of art very much like this. This type of needle art is called cruel. It's a type of uh, needlepoint, and she uh, used a lot of uh, freeform embroidery uh, types and stitches. She started using uh, commercial patterns and kits, but she became more and more uh, creative with it and more freeform as she got older. I'll, as we get further to the back of the museum, I'll talk a little bit more about her. I'll show more of her work and talk about how she got started. But I want to talk a little bit more about William as we move through the museum. William was um, an enthusiastic and eclectic collector himself. He framed, he was also a craftsman, so he framed all of his mother's works in frames identical to this. This was a popular pattern published in men's craft magazines of the day, like Work Basket and such as that. And so he made thousands of these to frame his mother's work. He was proud of her work and he entered it into shows like the National Holly Ho Hobby Hall of Fame where she won many prizes. And she became regionally famous for her work. She received a letter from Eleanor Roosevelt. She received a lot of top prizes in craft shows. And so William started a museum to show off both her work as well as his own collections. We, today we might call William a, hoar, a hoarder, <laughs> but at the time uh, we like to call him an enthusiastic and eclectic collector. He never met a single object that he didn't just love and want to preserve. So he loved things that were old, historic, beautiful, um, artistic, and so he collected anything really that he liked. Over time, um, people in town realized that he was saving things that were important and they would bring him things. So they would bring him things that they liked, things they thought were important. And as he was getting on in years, the mayor of the town in the 1950s started to realize that he really did have some important things that were historic to the town. So um, knowing that Julia lived to be 100, William was getting on in years as well. William did not have any children, so people began to worry about what was going to happen to the collection. And um, ultimately, they began to make a plan for how they were going to preserve the important things. He had the town's first stoplight, which uh, you'll see up here, it still works. And our public works department today still keeps it working and running for us. And um, he had, uh, I'll point out many more things, but he had very important maps deeds, original plots of um, land going back to the 17 and 1800s. Uh, Snow Hill is one of the oldest towns on the East Coast, one of the oldest towns in the country. Um, the Presbyterian Church was founded in the United States here and in Pocomoke, Maryland. So he had some really historic things going back uh, quite a ways that at the time people might not have realized how important they were, but over time it became clear that they were important and we needed to save them. So he started the uh, museum on his own private property with his own private money. 
He filled up, he was a flower grower, so he filled up his workshops, his home, his, uh, his outbuildings, until he built a special standalone building on his private property to house his collections and his mother's work. Um, this happened in the early 1940s, and by the 1950s, um, it moved into this building. I'll begin moving along so that you're be able to see what we have instead of just standing here listening to me talk. But um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the story as um, you find out how it came to be in this building. The collection spans from, I would say, the 1400s to the present day. Um, and we'll begin with our um, Native American collection. We have about a third of our collection on display at any given time. We rotate quite a bit so that all of our artifacts get a little love and also to conserve things from light and the elements. This is our People of the Pocomoke exhibit. Um, this rec represents the Pocomoke Nation. Uh, we're also right here nestled on the Pocomoke River. Um, as you look around the museum, you'll start to notice these cute little animals that don't seem to be belong in the spot where they are. This is part of a children's activity that we have here at the museum where children have to find uh, the animals around the museum and answer a little question about uh, what they're near and when they fill in the scavenger hunt, they get a prize. So that's one of our kids' activities that we have in the summer. Um, the oldest artifact in the museum is in this case. It's a 12,000 year old Miocene shark tooth that has been modified for use as a knife. So the shark tooth itself is about 12,000 years old, but the hand of man, as we say, um, has, uh, it's been modified to use as a knife about uh, 2,000 years ago. So as an artifact, it is about 2,000 years old. So what makes something an artifact is once it's been used by man, once it's been modified by man. So in one sense, it's 12,000 years old. In another sense, it's 2,000 years old. So we'll move along to our uh, American history exhibit. And this is where we sort of trace the history of the United States through local artifacts that we found here in the area of Snow Hill, Maryland on the Eastern shore. And um, one thing I do like to point out is um, a favorite artifact of mine, which is the long handled collections box from All Hallows Church. So it's uh, common to pass the collections plate at churches, but here uh, they, they passed, they pushed around the long handled collection box to each family so that it was a, very, a, little, a little extra pressure <laughs> to put a little money in the collections box as they handed that around. So uh, moving along through this exhibit, um, I wanted to point out another favorite exhibit, which is our Before Emancipation exhibit. Um, one uh, distinctive thing about Maryland is that it was a very divided state before emancipation. Um, part of Maryland on the Eastern Shore was very culturally aligned with Virginia um, and the South, and the other side of the Bay was more culturally aligned with Baltimore and the Union. So Maryland has artifacts from both the Confederacy and the Union, and we very much had brother against brother. This is an art. Of, this was is a challenging exhibit because we don't have a lot of artifacts to fill it because it's a painful um, area of our history and many of the things that might represent that time don't survive. People didn't like to keep them and they didn't always survive. Whether they came from black families or white families, um, people don't always like to remember that time. One thing we do have that's a painful reminder that people don't always like to remember is a shackle. So whether you were part of a family who had this, that, um, that you owned a slave or whether you were part of a family whose family member had this on them, it would be a very painful thing. Um, so we don't have an enormous number of pieces in this artifact, but we have a local um, community member and artist, uh, McKinley M. Smith. He's an African-American artist, and in order to give this 
um, exhibit a place to sit and think and feel and sit with that discomfort, I like to say. He painted this mural for us um, and he gave a lot of thought and a lot of discussion about his feelings about painting this exhibit for us, given his own uh, background for this exhibit. We have chairs here and we have items. We put please touch because we want people to be able, children and adults, to be able to think about the toys that um, children might have had to play with. And um, McKinley uh, gave a lot of thought to this in designing his mural. And I noticed that and he talked about, uh, I asked him about this and he told me that um, in plant, painting this plantation scene as a backdrop for these painful reminders, he put at the very tip top an eagle overlooking um, the entire scene in the hope that our country would eventually overcome um, some of this pain. So um, this is an exhibit that I do spend a lot of time talking about, especially to children. Um, and I, I do hope that the uh, work that um, McKinley and our staff has put into creating this exhibit uh, gives people something to think about as our country moves forward, especially in, in our current climate. Okay, I'd like to move across to um, an exhibit. Uh, this is called, this is our Out in Theater exhibit. And this is a mock-up of what used to be our Outen Theater. And this is, um, the Outen Theater is now on the corner where Toy Town in Snow Hill exists now, which is a large uh, toy, antique toy store. Um, William was known for rescuing anything he could that he thought might be important later. And he was before his time in doing that. He, um, he rescued things that at the time everyone else thought were junk. <laughs> and um, this is the, the Outen Theater burned. And before it burned, this is the film projector dated from 1935 from the Outen Theater. So we were able to rescue the film projector. This is one of the theater seats from the Outen Theater and, um, and the organ. So what we've done is these weren't originals. These are things we've printed and placed on the walls. These would have been movies that would have played at the time from the Alton Theater. Um, but one thing that we discovered only later, since I've been the director in the last five or six years, was that um, at the time, the Alton Theater was only for white people. So this was, and this building still stands, the Quonset Hut on Commerce Street was the theater that was for African-American residents in town, built in 1946. So once, um, once the uh, desegregation took place, this was later used for the Masonic Hall. But when we learned that there was a separate theater for African-American residents, we um, placed this in the Alton Theater display. And one of our uh, plans coming forward is to do a feature more than just this little picture to do a feature to um, better represent the um, Quonset hut as part of our theater display. So this uh, theater is due for renovation soon. So moving around to our um, Civil War exhibit. This, is, this has been renovated recently. We have a local collector who has preserved Civil War exhibits representing the division in Maryland um, from both Confederate and uh, Union soldiers. Um, you can see that this has been a recent um, change because if you notice our state divided sign up there <laughs> is still a temporary sign while we have our permanent sign made. Um, when I took over as curator, I, one area that I had um, less knowledge about, I tend to focus on my expertises in textiles, was weapons. So I, we had a large collection of guns here in the museum and I needed help dividing hunting guns from weapons. And so he helped me 
to make those distinctions and figure out which ones were for were used by the Confederacy, which ones were used by uh, the Union, and to have um, these separated and arranged appropriately into a new exhibit. So we have this here, and we are in the process of putting um, our new sign up and having this um, represented so that we have um, that history um, from the state of Maryland and specifically from the Eastern Shore um, represented. Um, I like to feel that even the painful parts of our history should be shown and not, not hidden. So this is also in the works. One of the things about museums is that they're always changing, we're always learning, and we're always um, trying to make sure that what we do is accurate and fair and appropriate. So these are some of the ways that we um, regroup and fix things or um, present things that have previously not been shown. Coming around the corner, we talk about Julia herself. Um, uh, this is a display of quite a lot of Julia's art. It's a portrait of Julia. And um, while the museum was named for Julia and does contain a lot of her art, as you've seen, there is quite a lot of Snow Hill and Worcester County history displayed. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces because it just is so colorful and cheerful and it shows um, such a variety of the stitches that she used. Um, in fact, I liked it so much I had it made into one of the postcards that's for sale in our, um, in our gift shop. Um, a lot of the people who remember Julia, who are now um, quite elderly, said she was kind of a no-nonsense, uh, down-to-earth lady but I feel that she had sort of a whimsical side and I'll show you why in just a few minutes. She um, made uh, dolls and whimsical little clowns for all of the children in town, even though she didn't have any grandchildren of her own. So even though she was thought of as a little stern and no nonsense, she had a fun side too. So I think I would have liked her. I'm going to have Lana turn around and show you my very favorite thing in the museum just because it's a little quirky and I'm a little quirky. This is, my dad's a mechanic so I love machines, and this is a coin operated perfume sprayer. <laughs> this would have been maybe in the bathroom of a general store. The room we're now in is a mock-up of a general store and the reason this exhibit is here is because Julia's father owned a general store. And Julia got her start learning needlework because it was her job as a young girl, we're talking 11, 12, 13 years old, to do stitchery for her dad's business. And what she did, which sounds a little macabre, one of the things that the general store offered was coffins. And if you were a rich, fancy person, you had sometimes padding and silk lining sewn into your coffin because you know, rich people need to be cozy when they're dead. So Julia would sew the silk lining into the coffins and that's how she started to learn to sew and to support the family business. And she was good at it and she was a, a wonderful seamstress her whole life. So to get back to my favorite artifact, in the um, bathroom of such a store, there would be a coin operated perfume sprayer. For, so for ladies of a certain class who might not be able to afford perfume at home, you would put your nickel or your penny into this slot at the side and you would pull this little lever and it would spray perfume on you and then you could go out for the evening. So if you were a lady of the evening, you would smell good <laughs> when you went out. So I uh, once did a talk on early mechanical devices and I discovered early vending machines and I went down a rabbit hole of research and I just love this idea that you could get a small amount of something for just a tiny amount of money. And I came across a wonderful image of two ladies in a ladies room and there were um, vending machines for both perfume and whiskey. So <laughs> I couldn't help but think I wanna go wherever they're going. But um, one of the earliest vending machines on record is 2,000 years old and was dispensing holy water. So after you got your whiskey and your perfume, you could get your holy water and you'd, you'd be covered. So <laughs> this is my favorite artifact. I just get such a kick out of that. 
Okay, coming back around the corner, one of the, um, I'll, let, I'll let Lana get around me so that she can get a good view of this. Um, one of the most memorable pieces in the Purnell Museum is the Penny Farthing Bicycle. Um, this would have been around 1900, and it, this was 1880, I, I stand corrected. Um, and most people can't guess what a penny farthing bicycle was called when it first came out. It was called a bicycle because that was the only kind of bicycle they had. So I love to, it was difficult to climb onto when it, it, it was sometimes called the mechanical horse. <laughs> um, it was difficult to ride, but there are still people who ride them. They even have races and, um, and uh, people who really enjoy them. But I love to read the quote that Mark Twain uh, said about them when he first tried to ride one. So I'm going to read it to you. He says, when you have reached the point in bicycling where you can balance the machine tolerably fairly and propel it and steer it, then comes your next task, how to mount it. You do it in this way. You hop along behind it on your right foot, resting the other on the mounting peg and grasping the tiller, he calls this the tiller, grasping the tiller with your hands. At the word, you rise on the peg, stiffen your left leg, hang your other one around in the air in a general and indefinite way, lean your stomach against the rear of the saddle, and then fall off. Maybe on one side, maybe on the other, but you fall off. You get up and do it again, and once more, and then several times. So basically, he was saying they're pretty impossible to ride, but people did ride them, and this was the bicycle that you had for decades. The reason that it's called a penny farthing bicycle is because of the comparative sizes of the wheels. So this was comparatively a penny and a farthing in English coins were the big coin and the little coin. And the reason that it had to be like this in order to ride it is that there was no chain. There were no gears and chains. So in order to get up any speed, you had to have this giant wheel. Um, this is something that people always remember when they come here is, did you see that bicycle? So um, this is something that I just uh, love to show off. And this was um, local, it's an American uh, bicycle. And if you look closely, you can see the ribbon that was still woven through it from a 4th of July parade. And it's the American flag ribbon um, that, that's still in it. You just saw me touch that, but pretend you didn't because I'm not supposed to touch that. <laughs> um, I do like to show off this quilt. This was made for us by the Worcester County Historical Society. And the motif on the quilt is the same motif that is our logo. And I'm not sure how well we'll be able to show it because of the light, but if Lana could swing around and show our rose window, um, that is our logo, and it's also the rose window of our building. So the museum's current location is a little church. Um, it was the town's first and last little Catholic church. It was, uh, I'll refer to this painting by local artist and school teacher Anne Strickland Hope. Um, this was part of the Wilmington Diocese, and it was a little mission church. It was St. Agnes Catholic Mission Church. It was um, never a very successful little church. Um, as I mentioned before, Presbyterianism was founded here in this area, and so they kind of already had a toehold on the religious community here. So uh, there weren't a lot of uh, Catholic parishioners uh, here in Snow Hill. And so in its heyday, it had about 18 members. And um, this was, building was built in 1891. So over time, um, those 18 members uh, moved away and passed away. And uh, the church was, was essentially left empty. So it was donated to the town and it was um, used for little functions like rotary meetings and things like that. Um, as William was getting on in years, uh, people began to be concerned after, after Julia died. Uh, William had no heirs, and so people started to wonder what was gonna happen to his um, large collection. He had a lot of treasures from the town, 
And so um, the mayor and council at the time began to uh, look for a way to save the collection so that it didn't become auctioned or scattered. Um, so ultimately the collection was moved from the uh, museum building that was on William's private property to this little building. Um, and it began to be called a large museum in a small building. So in 1957, they moved the museum, um, moving over 10,000 artifacts into this building. Um, we've sim since build, built on a small addition and there's a storage building for um, props and mannequins and things like that uh, to make it work here. So we're nestled here on the Pocomo River and um, this little building has been our home ever since. I wanna um, move along and show you a couple of special things that I love that were uh, part of Julia's work. Um, I always show these to people that sort of show the kind of person that Julia was. These two little pieces were made by Julia wide apart at different times in her life. So this one, was made by Julia at the age of nine. And this one, nearly identical, was made by Julia at the age of 92. So she, they're almost the same. And she uh, worked almost until the very end of her life. One funny thing about Julia, or interesting thing, is that she never needed glasses. And we don't know if this was because of all the close and careful work that she did or in spite of it, but she, uh, was never a lady to sit around and do nothing. Uh, she kept on working um, right up until the very end. This exhibit showcases some things that are special to Snow Hill's history. And some of my favorite are these um, very early uh, wooden uh, artifacts, uh, agricultural artifacts. This was um, possibly Native American made, but it is a barrel made from the trunk of a tree. It's all one piece with the exception of the bottom, which is attached with dowels. Um, I am going to touch these just to show them to you. But you can see this is a green scoop, all made in one piece. And my children who come in here often says this looks like something from the Flintstones but it is a trolley. But if you notice, the wheels are attached with no metal. So that is all, even the wheels are wooden. So this is unusual and, and rare, probably 1700s. And I like, I like this just because it shows how many generations of farmers use this, but originally this would have been made without any metal joinery but because it was used by so many generations of farmers, it was repaired multiple times using metal joinery long after the fact. So I love it because it shows a history of generations of farmers using it. So this is a little bit of the history of the agricultural life on the Eastern Shore. We're right here on the Pocomoke River, so we have a long history of uh, waterman life and there is currently a foot a move to bring a steamboat um, as a um, recreational um, activity here to have it travel from here to Pocomoke and have people enjoy uh, a dinner on it as a cruise so if that does happen which we have high hopes um, we will uh, be able to connect it to the history of that activity uh, the Pocomoke River is a deep and wide river and it was a major uh, line of transportation for um, goods to be brought in and out um, on the Eastern Shore. So we're looking forward to that possibility moving forward. Let's see, what did I wanna show you? There's so much. Um, as we pass our kids table, I do wanna mention, um, in the summertime, COVID has sort of put a, a crimp on our style in terms of our children's activities, but we have a Heritage Arts for Kids program in the summertime, which is one of our most uh, popular activities. And we have family regulars who come year after year, as well as Ocean City vacationers who, you know, after they their kids get bored at the beach or they have a rainy day, they come here um, looking for something to do. And so with that activity, kids come, they learn something about the museum, 
they make a work of art that's connected to something with the museum and they have something fun to take home with them. So we look forward to that every year. We were not able to do as much as we usually do this past year because of COVID, but we really have high hopes to get back on our offerings this year and welcome all of our beloved kids back to us this year. So um, watch our website at pernellmuseum.org and stay with us as we hope to welcome everybody back with open arms this year. Moving past our children's uh, touch me table where they get to play with some old toys, I wanted to um, just focus on some of the, our, our Snow Hill uh, important citizens. Um, I know a lot of sports fans will remember Judy Johnson, Julius Johnson, he went by Judy, but he was um, a famous baseball player who went on to be an important recruiter um, in what was called the Negro Baseball Leagues. Um, he was from Snow Hill. We've just put up a monument to him in front of our um, public library here in Snow Hill. And so these are some of the artifacts um, memorializing him and we have more that we'll be putting on display soon as we want to start to have a Judy Johnson day here in Snow Hill. So um, he's somebody that we want to remember and we hope to be doing more once we get past COVID um, to memorialize him because he did a lot to bring um, things back to our community. And last but not least, um, we have our exhibit here covering the resort area near us. Um, Ocean City is close by and so we get a great many visitors from Ocean City, but many people don't realize that Public Landing, which is right here in Snow Hill, was once the place to be. It was a resort area here in Snow Hill. And um, it had an amusement park rides, a bowling alley, movie theater, restaurants, uh, things that you would expect to see in a resort area. But it was hit by a hurricane in 1933. Um, by that time, Ocean City had begun to sort of rise up as the um, as a resort area itself, and so um, Public Landing was never rebuilt as um, as a resort. There's still a beautiful community there. There's still swimming, and um, it's a really nice area to go and enjoy the day. Um, but in its heyday, at the turn into the 20th century, uh, you would see um, Victorian ladies promenading on the boardwalk. You'd see beautiful bathing suits like this one covering ladies from head to toe because it was scandalous to show uh, very much skin and certainly not your legs, so you'd wear wool tights like these. And uh, we have an exhibit showing the evolution of bathing suits over time uh, that you would see uh, throughout the century. Um, and so um, I'll end it there, but I want to thank you for joining us for our virtual tour, invite you to come and see us in person, and to visit our website at www.pernellmuseum.org.